Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the February webinar for the Spring Hydrologic Outlook. This is Chris Foltz from the National Weather Service Central Region Headquarters. Today's briefing will be a general overview of the Spring Hydrologic Outlook for the Mississippi Basin, including the Red River of the North and the Great Lakes drainages. Additional information and forecasts can be found online at www.weather.gov. Today's presenters are Jim Knoll from the Ohio River Forecast Center, Mike Welvert from the North Central River Forecast Center, Kevin Lau from the Missouri Basin River Forecast Center, James Paul from the Arkansas Red Basin River Forecast Center, and Jeff Grushel from the Lower Mississippi River Forecast Center. This webinar is being recorded and a follow-up email will be sent with information on how to access it as soon as it is available. All questions will be held until the end of the presentation. If you happen to have a question during the presentation, please do utilize the question box in the GoToWebinar GUI. With that, we'll go ahead and turn it over to our first presenter, Jim Knoll. All right, thanks, Chris, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to go over a little uh, overview of the antecedent conditions and uh, current conditions, and then look at the uh, weather and climate outlooks and finish up with our river forecast outlooks. So with that, uh, let's start with uh, winter precipitation so far. And basically, much of the Mississippi River drainage system is at or below normal precipitation up to this point of the winter season. The exceptions are in the upper Missouri Basin and portions of Montana and Wyoming, as well as in portions of the Great Lakes, and also a developing area from the eastern Ohio into the Cumberland, Tennessee Valley and down into the lower Mississippi Valley. As we uh, shift to the next slide, uh, we'll be looking at temperatures, and most of this winter uh, so far has been marked by below normal temperatures across the Mississippi drainage as well as into the Great Lakes and the Red River of the North areas. Uh, temperatures generally one to five degrees below normal. The only area where we've seen above normal temperatures so far this winter has really been along the uh, Rocky Mountain area uh, where temperatures are a few degrees above normal. Uh, looking at snowfall, really most of the area has seen about normal to a little bit below normal snowfall across the, the uh, mid part of the country. The exceptions really would be in the northern Rockies in uh, Montana area as well as in portions of the Great Lakes. And there was a little bit of early winter snow down in the deep south that did coat that area again earlier into, in the winter season. Uh, moving ahead to our next slide, the snow water content. Um, one of the big highlights in that upper right image is the light gray area is really very uh, shallow water content, not very much water in the snowpack. Uh, the, only in the red areas, uh, portions of Montana, as well as maybe northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin into uh, portions of the Great Lakes is where we have at least an inch of uh, water content in the snowpack. So the main message here is we do have widespread light snowpack across the uh, northern part of the basin but it's not got a lot of water content into, into that. And that's a, a good thing in terms of a flood potential, at least. Uh, moving ahead, you'll see in the next several slides, kind of the same theme as we showed in the precipitation. This is a, a look at the soil moisture conditions uh, as of yesterday. And the, the big areas to note are some wetness in the uh, Montana area, the lingering drought in portions of North Dakota and Northeastern Montana, some wetness in the Great Lakes, developing wetness then uh, with the wet pattern in the uh, eastern Ohio Valley down into the Cumberland and Tennessee Valley extending down into a little bit of the lower Mississippi Valley. At the same time, an expanding area of dryness from Missouri into Kansas and Oklahoma. Moving ahead, we'll see that same message then uh, show up in the drought status of the U.S. Drought Monitor. And what that is showing is uh, the drought conditions continuing over portions of North and South Dakota, as well as a big expanding area of drought across portions of Kansas, Oklahoma, into Northwest Arkansas and Missouri. Uh, it should be noted, uh, unlike last year, this is the uh, most drought coverage or dryness across the United States as a whole in the last four years. So we have seen an expansion of the dryness up to this point in the winter season uh, across the middle portion of the country. Looking ahead to the USGS streamflow conditions, uh, we do see that wetness showing up in the northern Rockies as well as in, in the eastern Ohio Valley down into the Cumberland and Tennessee Valley extending down into the lower Mississippi Valley in the blue dots and uh, light blue dots. And then in those orange and red dots from Illinois through Missouri, Kansas, and Oklahoma, that is kind of where that drought area is, and you're seeing it showing up with uh, significantly below normal stream flow conditions as reported by the U.S. Geological Survey. 
<clears throat> Moving ahead to the next slide, we're looking at the Army Corps of Engineers <clears throat> total flood control storage that's available. And the main message here is, is as of February 2018, about 96% of the uh, of the flood control capacity is still uh, available for use. So if we do have heavy rain events, the Army Corps of Engineers will be able to utilize a lot of that flood control capacity. Now we're gonna shift gears and look at the uh, short-term weather and climate outlooks, and then we'll be shifting after that into our hydrologic outlooks. So over the next week, we're expecting a very active weather pattern across the lower Mississippi Valley into the Tennessee, Cumberland, and Ohio Valleys. The areas that you see there in red are in excess of three inches of rainfall. That is from now through uh, early next Thursday. There is additional rain just after this, and as confidence also grows, these totals could easily grow to some areas uh, receiving upwards of at least five, five or six inches in that path uh, that you see there from Arkansas and on up into the Ohio Valley. At the same time, the northwestern half of the um, Mississippi drainage system on up into the Red River of the north area is actually pretty quiet with precipitation totals generally only a quarter of an inch or less. So it's kind of a tale of two different air masses, if you will, a kind of a drier air mass to the northwest half of the area and a wet air mass to the southeast half of the area over the next week. As we move into our week two outlook that takes us into the end of February, we continue to see that same kind of pattern with a colder pattern in the northwestern area and uh, portions of the upper Missouri basin, but then turning warm across the southeastern half of the Mississippi drainage system. At the same time, that'll set up a storm track to carry from the southwestern U.S. on up into the mid-Mississippi Valley and then on up into the Tennessee, Cumberland, and Ohio Valley and clipping a portion of the southern Great Lakes area as well with wet conditions. So the bottom line here is what we see over the next week, we're going to see it continue even this following week and take us all the way into February 28th. As we then look forward even further into the March, April, and May timeframe, we're kind of expecting that same kind of pattern to at least linger into the springtime as well with the coolness being confined to the upper Missouri basin, but warm uh, weather is expected across the southern Mississippi Valley into the Ohio Valley. We do expect the wetness that will run from the lower uh, Mississippi Valley into the Ohio Valley the next couple of weeks to kind of shift north more into the Ohio Valley and Great Lakes and may even clip the eastern portion of the upper Mississippi Valley as we move into that March, April, and May time frame. In terms of uh, drought outlook by the uh, Climate Prediction Center of NOAA, um, we're expecting really where we were showing earlier, the drought monitor was showing the drought areas across um, portions of the Arkansas Red Basin, extending on up into North Dakota and that. We're expecting really not a lot of change. Um, much of the area that's in drought right now will have lingering drought, though this heavy rain over the next few weeks may improve that drought in the eastern portion of the Arkansas and Red Basin over eastern Oklahoma and Arkansas, and then extending up into a little bit of the lower Missouri Valley. So we may see some improvement there, but further to the west and north, probably more of the same with drought lingering in the plains on up into North Dakota as we go into the springtime of March and April and potentially even into May. Now we're gonna go ahead and shift gears and see how all of this uh, weather and climate stuff turns into our river outlooks as we go into the, uh, the spring season. So this is the overall uh, Mississippi drainage system as well as the Red River, the North Great Lakes, Soros Basins. And the whole bottom line here is it's getting more of that same. I put that black style line in there, kind of denotate, denotating the northwest half of the area. Not a lot of flood risk, um, maybe some minor flooding, but not a lot of flood risk uh, as it looks right now at the 50% chance level uh, over the next uh, few months into April while we're expecting quite a bit of minor to moderate flooding over the southeastern portion of the area where the active weather pattern and climate pattern will be over the next uh, several weeks to over a month. So again, minor to moderate flooding is expected over that southeast half of the uh, drainage area. So with that now, we're gonna break it down by River Forecast Center and kind of go around, and we'll be going ahead and starting in the Ohio River Basin at first. 
So with that, we are expecting a above-normal flood risk in the Ohio and Cumberland Valleys. The exception will be in the northeastern or upper Ohio Valley of southwest New York, western Pennsylvania, and northeast Ohio. That area is considered about normal. So breaking it down, in Indiana and Illinois, we do expect minor flooding along the Wabash, Little Wabash, and Maumee River basins. In Kentucky, we do expect minor to moderate flooding in the Cumberland and Kentucky River basins with minor flooding in the Green and Licking River basins. Further to the northeast in Ohio, minor flooding is expected, especially in the Maumee and the Muskingum basins, as well as the Great Lakes watersheds. And we do expect some minor flooding in West Virginia, especially in the Monongahela and Little Kanaw basins. And along the Ohio River, we are expecting at least minor flooding, and especially in the lower half of that basin. And again, this outlook takes us all the way through uh, April. However, it's very important with this active weather pattern to look at there's at least a 25% chance of some significant flooding in those red dots uh, across a good portion of Kentucky, portions of Indiana, Illinois, and northwestern Ohio. And again, even underneath that, there is a 10% chance of significant flooding really over most of the basin except the far upper Ohio. The bottom message in the Ohio Valley and Cumberland Valley is a very active weather pattern over the next several weeks that could linger at least into March. In addition, we do have in the short term our flood outlook through this weekend, we already have active flooding that is either ongoing or expected to develop over the next several of days. We are expecting a minor to moderate flood event in northern West Virginia and southwestern Pennsylvania that will also work down the upper Ohio River Basin including the Ohio River. We also expect some flooding to develop in the lower Ohio River as we move through the weekend and into next week. And again, depending on how the storm systems develop over the next week or so, we could see some pretty significant flooding across portions of the Ohio and Cumberland Valley. So to sum it up for the Ohio and Cumberland River basins, we do expect minor to moderate flooding uh, through the spring in the Ohio and Cumberland River basins, and we cannot rule out major flooding. The flood risk is considered above normal for all of the Ohio River basin, including the Cumberland area, except for the upper Ohio basin, which is considered normal. There is at least a 25% chance of significant flooding of moderate or greater flooding, especially in the southern and western portion of the Ohio Valley into the Cumberland Valley into spring, and the rainfall and especially the thunderstorms will determine the final flood threat for the Ohio and Cumberland River basins. And with that, I'm now going to turn it over to Mike at the North Central River Forecast Center. Thanks, Jim. We'll shift gears up to the northern part of the uh, Mississippi Basin, including uh, Red River of the North and the Seward Basin in North Dakota, as well as parts of the Western Great Lakes. Uh, Jim touched on a lot of things that I'm going to mention briefly. Uh, I just wanted to point out and zoom in a little bit on the water content of the snow. Uh, again, the, the coverage is fairly widespread across the area, but the amounts of snow and how much water is contained in that snow are relatively small. Uh, we do have a couple of bands of around an inch, uh, maybe up to two inches in a few spots across southern Minnesota through northern Wisconsin and also uh, across Iowa through Chicago area over to Detroit. Um, but that's really at an inch to inch and a half uh, about that much water in, contained in the snowpack, which isn't a lot for this time of year. Uh, the highest snow water content uh, contained up in the upper peninsula of Michigan and perhaps northern Michigan where lake effect snows have uh, taken hold for much of the last couple of weeks. Next slide, please. Taking a look at the water content uh, a little differently. This is the ranking, uh, how you might compare it to a normal year. And anywhere you see the orange or red colors there, uh, you're looking at a much lower than normal um, ranking of how much snow is on the ground. And if you can see there up in North Dakota and then also across the western portion, central portion of Minnesota, uh, very dry and the, the lowest uh, 10 to 20 percent uh, of all historical records. So that's very low water content for this time of year for that area. Uh, further to the south, in contrary, um, the uh, blue colors there indicating the higher than normal amount of snow water for this time of year. And that's owing to the snow that they've experienced across those areas in the last couple of weeks. However, that is changing a little bit uh, the last few days here uh, and stretching into tomorrow. 
some warm temperatures and the rain that Jim mentioned uh, falling on that area should to help to melt a lot of that snow away. So I would imagine that ranking will change next week. Next slide. Next slide, please. There we go, temperatures. Um, it's been fairly cold through the winter across the area, especially in February. Uh, December, a little bit cool, especially through the Great Lakes areas uh, with temperatures running two to five degrees below normal. January ended up about normal, but looking at February uh, so far, um, anywhere from uh, five to six degrees below normal across Michigan to as much as 10 to 13 below normal across Minnesota and into the Dakotas. So the very cold temperatures uh, moving through the area, uh, helping to produce a little bit of snow, especially in the Upper Peninsula, uh, and also helping to form some frost. If we go to the next slide, uh, the cold temperatures and the relative lack of snow cover has allowed that cold air to really drive deep into the ground. And we've got some pretty good frost depths across the, the upper Mississippi Valley here. Anywhere you see the blue uh, colors, you're looking at pretty deep frost, anywhere from two feet to as much as four feet of, of frost in the ground. Uh, and that's pretty low for this time of year. We usually see the maximum frost depth occur as we get into the first part of March. So the frost could go a little deeper in some of those areas. Uh, anywhere you see the, the lighter colors, the yellows and oranges and even the red, uh, stretching from Missouri up into Michigan. Uh, we had a warm up in January that really kept us, uh, lasted quite a while and that helped the soil to uh, get rid of a lot of its frost. So the, the depth there isn't as much and how frost plays into the flood risk, the deeper the frost is, and especially if you have really moist ground when it freezes up, that can act as a barrier. So when the snow does melt or when you get any future rainfall this spring, that doesn't allow the rain to soak into the ground and it runs off and causes an enhanced flood risk. So if you have areas with less frost, there's better chance that that frost will disappear, allowing water to soak in and that reduces your flood risk. So when we combine all these things together, uh, that plays into the, the final flood risk that we'll talk about here in a second. Moving on to the next slide, please. Um, one other factor that plays in is uh, ice coverage. Those cold temperatures did generate quite a bit of ice across the, the region and that uh, allowed for some pretty good depth of ice in the river systems. Um, but because our flow overall was kind of low, Jim mentioned that earlier that the, the flow uh, due to the dryness, the rivers were much lower than normal in a lot of places. So despite the fact that we have a lot of snow in the river, or I'm sorry, a lot of ice in the river, um, we just haven't been experiencing that many ice jams. Uh, we have a few, uh, they've been scattered around uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, maybe Northern Illinois off and on through the winter but really nothing that's been significant. We've only had minor nuisance flooding and in very few locations. We could have some ice jamming as we move further into the spring, depending on how uh, the ice breaks up as it moves out. Uh, but at this point, that risk looks to be a little lower than normal. And next slide, please. Taking all these factors into account, uh, looking at the flood risk across the area, as Jim mentioned, we're looking at uh, not a real big chance for any flooding across the area. We would consider it pretty much normal. Um, the, the risk from snow melt itself is probably below normal considering we don't have a lot of snow on the ground. But when you factor in other things such as that frozen ground, uh, the fact that we're gonna have a, a cool spring it looks like, uh, anytime we can linger that frost longer in the year, uh, you run the risk of putting rainfall on top of frozen ground which may enhance the runoff and increase the flood risk. So we're gonna stick with about a normal chance across the area. Uh, the risk for any significant flooding uh, reaching the major or, or moderate category doesn't look that high in our portion of the uh, upper Mississippi Valley. And next slide will take us up into the North Dakota area, the Suris River and also the Red River of the North. Um, the risk up there is, is below normal, especially in the Suris Basin where they're deeper into that drought area we talked about. Um, the Red River is probably near normal or maybe just a little bit below normal in that area as well. The flows are low, uh, but we do have that, that frost depth to contend with, so we'll have to watch out for that potential in the spring. And with that, I'll pass off to Kevin down at Missouri Basin. Thank you, Mike. Um, my first graphic is um, intended to show a um, comparison of the probability to reach flood stage this spring as compared to the modeled historical probability of reaching flood stage. And so this graphic doesn't show whether or not we expect a particular location to actually make it to flood stage, 
but shows that uh, weather conditions are more favorable or less favorable for a site to see flooding. Uh, cool colors, blues and greens, indicate a reduced risk for flooding. Warm colors, yellows and oranges, indicate an increased risk for flooding, again, as compared to normal. So with that said, much of the basin, uh, much of the Missouri River Basin has a reduced risk to see flooding this spring as compared to normal. And even some of the white dots that you see in the western areas really do indicate a reduction in flood risk, but due to the fact that uh, these locations uh, have a very low probability for flooding to begin with, uh, the, uh, the reduction has a, uh, a limit, so to speak. So what really stands out to me are the number of uh, cool colors in the Dakotas and in the east and uh, southeastern portion of the basin. So overall, we are projecting a reduced risk for springtime flooding over most of the Missouri Basin this spring. And that sort of stands to reason, as has already been alluded to, uh, in the Missouri Basin, about 60% uh, of the basin is abnormally dry or worse, according to the drought monitor. About 29% of the basin is actually classified as being in drought. My next slide, um, to look at the Missouri Basin, you really have to look at the mountains and then the plains. So um, we'll first look at the mountains. And the left-hand plot here shows uh, the mountainous basin snowpack conditions in percent of normal snow water equivalent, how much liquid is in the snow. Mountain snowpack is above normal for the upper Missouri, including the Milk Basin, the Missouri Basin above Fort Peck, and the Yellowstone. The Platte system isn't faring as well this year with the South Platte below normal and the North Platte headwaters being slightly below normal. By this point in the winter, we have accumulated approximately 70% of the seasonal peak snow water equivalent in the mountains. And so we still have a little ways to go and so things could change. The February water supply forecast issued by the National Weather Service is shown on the right-hand side and this was for conditions as of February the 1st. And it does suggest a slightly above average mountain runoff year, volumetrically speaking, for the upper Missouri, and a slightly below average runoff year for the North Platte, and a below average runoff year for the South Platte. With the next slide, we'll move to the plains. And it has already been discussed, um, plain snow in the Missouri Basin is also widespread but relatively shallow. And the exceptions to this would be eastern Montana and the area around northeast Nebraska and northwest Iowa. In eastern Montana, snow water equivalents are typically less than three inches, while northwest Iowa and the bordering area of Nebraska are generally two or less inches of water equivalent. And so right now, Plains snowpack does not look to be a factor in spring flood potential. Now I'll go uh, watershed by watershed within the Missouri uh, Basin, indicating those uh, sub-basins that have a 50% or greater chance of seeing flooding this spring. Um, as I've said, widespread significant flooding from mountain snowpack is not likely this year, but we are expecting some minor flooding in a couple of locations in the mountains, namely the Clark's Fork Yellowstone in Montana, and possibly in the Wind River in Wyoming. With the next slide, we'll be moving eastward. And minor flooding is possible along the lower reach of the North Platte River in Nebraska, and also in some of the smaller tributaries in the state of Nebraska uh, in the extreme eastern portion of the state. And finally, we'll move southward and consider the lower portion of the Missouri Basin with the states of Kansas and Missouri. Flooding in this area is driven by thunderstorm activity. And even though the soils are quite dry, we will have flooding in this area this spring. We have a better than a 50-50 chance for minor flooding in the southern portion of the Big Blue Basin, located in Kansas, and along the Platte River in Missouri. Many of the smaller tributaries in Missouri will also experience minor flooding. We are projecting moderate level flooding in the Grand and Osage basins, and along the Tarkio River in Missouri. And the Missouri River itself will likely see minor flooding in reaches below Nebraska City. But again, this is not atypical. And so I'll move to my summary slide. 
And so in, uh, in summary for the Missouri River Basin, snowpack conditions in the northern Rockies are above normal while the Platte system is below. Plain snowpack will not be a player this year, at least not now. As we move toward warmer temperatures, we will have to watch for ice jams due to river ice breakup. We expect it to be a busy year in the Missouri Basin. Perhaps some flooding in the mountainous west, but the bulk of the flooding in the Missouri Basin this spring will be driven by uh, thunderstorm activity in the lower third, resulting in episodic and isolated flooding events, and this is typical. Overall, we are calling for a reduced flood risk for the Missouri River Basin this spring. Thank you. This concludes my potential or my flood potential brief, and I'll turn the presentation over to James in the Arkansas Red River Basin. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As Jim showed with a couple of his slides earlier, the ABRFC has been in the midst of a prolonged dry spell. Although I'm not showing it here with any graphics um, from the drought monitor, Jim showed one earlier. At the start of the water year last October, the basin had about 2% of its area in moderate drought or worse. Um, the mor this morning's least drought monitor that was issued indicated almost 97% is now experiencing at least moderate drought with almost 30 percent in extreme drought and the two graphics on this slide give a good indicator of just how dry it has been the nrcs image in the upper left shows that the arkansas basin in colorado only has about 63 percent of normal snow water equivalent this season and the image in the lower right shows our estimates of the last 90 days percent of normal precipitation you can see most of the basin is at 50% or less of normal rainfall. Those white areas show locations that have not received any measurable precipitation in the last 90 days. On the next slide, um, I'm showing the reservoir fullness across the eastern half of the basin. I'm doing this for two reasons. The first is to show that most of the lakes have their entire flood control storage available and that those are, um, and those that are in the flood pool are utilizing less than 10%. So when we do get spring storms, they are in good shape to capture any excess runoff that may occur. The second reason I'm showing this is to show that despite the recent dry weather, most of the lakes are near the top of their conservation pools. So we, at least at this time, we aren't hurting with respect to water supply issues, at least across the eastern half of the basin. And finally, on my last slide, despite the recent dryness, Typically, much of the spring flooding in our area occurs with convective rainfall systems and thunderstorm complexes. So for most of the ABRFC, the flood potential is near normal. However, we do have a lower than normal flood risk along the Arkansas River in Colorado due to the lack of potential snowmelt this year. And with that, I'll pass it along to Jeff at the Lower Mississippi River Forecast Center. All right, thank you, James. As far as the, the lower part of the Mississippi Basin, it's really two stories. One is kind of what G, uh, James had alluded to already in the parts of northeast Texas, parts of Arkansas and southern Missouri. We've had uh, rainfall de deficits of four to eight inches over the last 90 days, and so we have very dry conditions over those areas. But in contrast, as you go east into the Tennessee Valley, we've had a, a number of rainfall uh, events across those areas, including we had three to six inches, I guess, uh, last weekend that's caused those areas to, to be pretty wet, and, and those areas are starting to recede from some of the flooding that we had uh, earlier in the week and, and over the weekend. Next slide. As you would expect, with the drier conditions and stuff across Arkansas and, and, and Texas, all the flood storage is available for all of the reservoirs uh, in those areas. Uh, but as we go eastward, where we've had a lot of the rainfall that's occurred over the last few weeks, we are starting to utilize a little bit of the storage from some of the core and TVA reservoirs across the Yazoo Basin in Mississippi and then the Tennessee tributaries going into the Tennessee River. Next slide. As you expect, uh, the stream flows from the USGS really reflect exactly the last two slides I've showed. Uh, we got much below to below normal uh, stream flows across Arkansas and Missouri. 
in Tennessee, in the Mississippi Valley, and in parts of the state of Mississippi, you're seeing much above to above normal stream flows across those areas. Next slide. So the flood potential that uh, for the lower Mississippi Basin, we're expecting above normal risk for flooding, uh, especially over the Tennessee Valley, the lower part of the Ohio, and the lower part of the Mississippi River. Uh, specifically, um, on the state of Mississippi, we're expecting possibly minor to moderate flooding on the Yazoo Basins, Big Black, Pearl, and Pascagoula Basins. Uh, as, as far as uh, the Mississippi and the Ohio, uh, with the rainfall that we're anticipating over the next week to two weeks, we can expect to possibly have minor to moderate flooding along the lower Ohio and portions of the lower part of the Mississippi River. Elsewhere, though, we are really seeing seasonal flooding with any rain events that we uh, have that will occur over the next uh, several months. So, uh, no, uh, just an average flood risk for other areas but Tennessee Valley, lower parts of the Ohio, Mississippi, we are expecting above average risk. And that concludes uh, the lower portion of the Mississippi, and I will turn it over to Jim. All right, thanks, Jeff. And so we're just going to go ahead and summarize everything up. Um, it does look like there's an above normal flood risk across the southeastern portions of the region, including the Ohio, Cumberland, Tennessee, and lower Mississippi River basins as we go into spring. There is either a normal or slightly below normal flood risk for the Great Lakes, Red River of the North, Soros, and Upper Mississippi River basins, as well as the eastern portion of the Arkansas and Red River basins. But there is a below normal risk as we move out into the Colorado portion of the Arkansas basin. And finally, in the Missouri River basin, there is a below normal flood risk. So again, I wanna stress, basically the northwest half of our region we're expecting either a normal or below normal flood risk, while the southeastern portion of the basin is the normal to above normal flood risk. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to Chris for any comments or questions. All right, thanks, Jim, I uh, appreciate that. Right now, we actually have no questions in our question box on the GoToWebinar, so if you happen to have one, type one in real quick. Uh, alternately, I guess if you uh, have entered your audio pin, feel free to raise your hand and I can unmute, mute you uh, and you can ask your question at that time. So I'll pause here for just a few seconds to give someone a chance to do that if they'd like to do so. Okay, I'm seeing no hands raised. I'm not seeing any other questions. So we'll go ahead and wrap things up. You know, do want to thank you for your participation on today's webinar. As uh, the, the slide there references, we will be providing an update to the Spring Hydrologic Outlook, and we'll be conducting another webinar on th Thursday, March 1st at 2.30 p.m. Central Time. I did go ahead and just send out the invites and webinar information to everyone on the uh, that received this previous one. Uh, with that, we'll say have a great afternoon, and again, this recording will be available. Oh, thank you. Pause for just a second. Two questions just came in. Uh, so we have a question here uh, regarding the Upper Missouri Valley. Uh, and do we expect that the frost depths in the Upper Missouri Valley will contribute to flooding? There's a question from Alex Rober. So I don't know, the Upper Missouri, do you, uh, do you want to take that, Kevin? Sure, sure. Thank you for that question. Uh, we don't believe so. Um, we believe that the soils, for the most part, were uh, not saturated uh, when the frost started setting in. And so we don't we don't see frozen ground as um, enhancing the production of runoff. All right, Kevin, thanks. Um, huh? Any other, no other, no other questions uh, coming in at this point. So again, uh, this recording will be uh, uploaded to YouTube and I'll provide a link to everyone on the email distribution list, hopefully this afternoon. Uh, and again, the email invites for the next one on March 1st have been sent out. With that, have a great afternoon and we'll talk to you in two weeks.